Hello, welcome to another toneless landscape oil painting demonstration. It's your painter in residence. I'm Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is called Dawn Stream. It's a 10 by 14, and I completed this a few days back. Um, went through about three different, not passes, I would say, but three different um, uh, painting sessions, you know, I wasn't able to get it all done in one go. And a lot of times that happens when you start scaling up a little bit, or uh, uh, I will say, like, uh, you'll see when I get to the, you know, the color bit, and there will be a little missing bit of the grasses. Sorry, don't know what happened. Sometimes the phone rings or something, and I forget to hit record again, but most of the painting's there for you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was prior to doing those main grasses, you know, I'd got the sky done, a bunch of trees done, the water, um, things like that. And I just found myself starting to get a little um, mentally fatigued. And uh, what I would do is, is tell you if, that's hap if that happens to you, and it will, because, uh, you know, it seems like a very quiet activity, but painting does require quite a lot of mental effort and energy um, basically the best thing to do is if you feel like you're dragging a bit it's just to to and the you know find a place in the painting where you can stop and then pick up the ball and run with it the next day yeah uh, which is what I did here uh, I was maybe a couple of days later and you'll see towards the end the painting goes a little mm, flattish that's because the paint tends to go matte when everything gets dry yeah um, what you see me working on now is my drawing stage. Now, the board I'm working on is a bit of uh, hard board. It's been prepped with two coats of transparent gesso. And that whole drawing stage, underpainting stage, was done with burnt umber. Um, it's quite attractive to do the burnt umber on the um, hard board. Uh, and a lot of times I might use either black or something like burnt umber. Well, sometimes raw umber too. I like the burn umber because it's got a little bit more of a richy red uh, feel to it. And um, that rich redness can be really helpful um, in counteracting uh, greens and things like that. That's a really good color to have for your underpainting. Um, so uh, that's that's where we're at now. So if you haven't tried painting on a bit, the nice thing, other nice thing about hardboard, I have a, you know a boxes of uh, boards cut and prepped. Um, you know, just basically because you never know when there's going to be a shortage out here uh, with the way the world's going. So I should be able to paint for quite a while. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's how I think, you know, I'll be painting, painting my way through the Armageddon eh? Anyway, um, not that we're going to get into current topics because we're all here to relax and do some painting. Um, this scene I, I have painted before, and I, I it's probably on the channel somewhere. Gosh knows what I called it. Um, I did a five by seven, and I'm thinking this is around 2017 or so, maybe 18, and I did an 11 by 14 or something. Um, uh, it I it had some issues, and one of the things that I didn't really realize what those issues were, and they were mostly compositional. Like this, that mass of trees that you see on our left, um, in the original reference was on the right, but the problem was like the little stream or rivers pointing you to the to the right, and there was nothing to really counterbalance it. Also in the reference, it's just a big solid block or wedge of trees running across the entire um, scene. Um, so what I did here was I just made a tree mass which is basically out of my imagination um, and then I put some we, I didn't even bother to define it those shapes in the distance you'll see we're going to paint them in with ba what is essentially going to be the sky colors um, just to give it some distance and feel and uh, I'm real happy with the way it turned out and with the uh, the, um, the the decisions I made to improve the scene and that's the kind of thing you know if you, you, you hear the old M. Francis broken record but that kind of thing comes from experience knowing how things aren't working or will work and what I would encourage you to do is if you want to paint and get good at painting you know try and do something every day and um, 
that's how you'll get good. It's really the only way. I mean, you can watch videos and get tips, and tips are great and they're helpful. Um, in fact, they can be life changing, but they really are going to be, those tips are really going to be way more life changing and accelerated um, if you are putting your, if you're, you have actual painting practice and you're working at it every day. That's how you make the big gains. And that's, the biggest gain of all is always spotting compositional issues with your work. Um, most paintings, I would say, succeed or fail. Well, they can succeed or fail for a lot of different reasons, but the biggest reason is always composition, if you ask me. If the composition's right, the color can be a little off, the values might be even a little off, but it will probably still succeed fairly well as a painting. If the composition's wrong, it doesn't matter how uh, much uh, virtuosity you show with your color handling or your um, you know your, your movement of the values um, it'll fall flat because the overall structure of it isn't right and it's one of the hardest things to learn composition it really is I mean you can there's a great book by Edgar Payne I recommend you pick up uh, there's a, uh, um, a little view of it if you search on my channel for composition uh, it's composition of landscape painting by Edgar Payne you see a little blow by blow, a little breakdown of the book, uh, you know, where I take you through it. And uh, that's a good one to get, and it will teach you some stuff. But the best way to learn is by doing lots of paintings, even, even little thumbnail drawings, even little sketches can help you, you know, walk around and, and try and interpret scenes. And that's how you get uh, an interior vocabulary, and it's highly subjective. You know, you've got your basic compositional motifs, like the, sea, the steel yard, they call it, and the... Uh, which I'm always doing, you know, uh, the O, the S, um, etc. Oh, <clears throat> speaking of, some people have um, asked me about my book. I have basically the whole book done except for the demonstration section, which I think is almost optional in this modern world where we have all these videos of painting demonstrations. So the holdup has been that I need somebody that, to work on editing. Uh, that would be pr proficient in the publishing program that I put the book in, which is Affinity Designer. So if that's you, hey, send me an email. Um, at some point, uh, I'll have to... Uh, I can't edit it because my spelling uh, is is not good. Uh, well, it catches the spelling stuff, but um, I'm an autodidact. I didn't pay any attention in school. I was too busy rebelling, so I'm basically self-taught. Um, Anyway, uh, just a little aside there for some people that have asked. What else do we want to talk about? Oh, let's talk about the groovy. I think I'm really uh, happy with the um, the color direction of this painting, and it's fairly similar to the last time I did the scene. Um, it's purples working off of yellows and then moving into greens, you know. Um, I did bring in some blues, you know. They're, they're subtle and they're muted, and... Um, they're definitely keyed off of and working with the purples and the purples aren't screamy they're they're sort of muddy purples which is usually your best bet if the purples are too bright you know it's going to be distracting it's not a color that you want to be really super you know you don't want Crayola purple uh, for the most part um, but you there too that's practice and experience um, learning how to um, to work colors together. Now I will point out that like one of the big biggest questions I get is oh how'd you mix the colors? What colors are you using in the live session of this video which is three hours long? Um, there is a whole like maybe 10 to 15 minute section where I mix all the basic colors for the painting and also at the beginning there's another five to ten minute session where I'm doing some drawing, uh, or I'm talking about things we're going to do in the drawing stage. And I'm talking about things I changed to make a better composition. So I'm definitely trying to up the educational quotient of the live videos. So if you tipped in and out before, you might want to tip in again. And uh, especially if you like this painting. I mean, you could almost look at it as... Um, 
you don't really have to stay uh, as a member month after month. I, I definitely do have people that do that, and most some of them, you know, maybe maybe don't even watch. It. They're just helping uh, helping me out, uh, helping my practice out. Um, but you know, if you see a particular pain, you go, "Wow, I'd really like to know how he did that more." Um, just uh, there's a link below the video. Click on it, and join the members area. And, watch that video you could almost look at it as a, a six dollar lesson <laughs> because like I said you can tip in and tip out <coughs> anyway um, <clears throat> one of the other challenges I had and I kind of I covered this in the uh, live session was I had this stream but it had a lot more strong blues uh, in the reference and a lot of colors that were maybe much more contrasty and saturated than the sky um, let's face it, I composited the sky in, so that kind of thing can happen. And a lot of times, too, in your reference, the water can take on really blue aspects when you start tweaking the colors in your reference. And uh, so what I did was I went ahead and brought it into Photoshop and knocked that back and made it, you know, so it ties more to the sky. Because a lot of times what will happen is you'll just start pulling things from the reference into your painting color-wise, and you won't even realize that you're doing it. Uh, and you might not realize that there's a real issue or problem um, until you're hanging it up uh, for your a show in a gallery or something like that. So uh, it's a good to, uh, well, again, that's experience, you know, and knowing that I have hung those paintings up in the show going, oh, man, that's not right. <laughs> uh, yeah, and even then, how, uh, it, you know, it's great maybe if you sell one of those on, but then again, that's one of your paintings banging around in the uh, uh, the the land of art history too that could have been better you know uh, and I do paint for art history and not in a vain way you know I just think that that is the real criteria pardon me of what will be considered good or not um, because when you remove the hype and you remove the politics and you remove the uh, even geograph, uh, geographic uh, locale and things, um, the work has to stand on its own. And when the work has to stand on its own, uh, that's when the good stuff uh, will rise to the top, you know. Anyway, let's see, we got another minute or two here. What can we talk about? Oh, yeah, I'm going to have this painting for sale in my store. Um, I'm going to do this one for uh, $350, okay? That's U.S. with international shipping. And I've been doing that as uh, the last five or six videos. I'm probably just going to just do that from here on out. Keep in mind, though, that the um, the pictorial representation in the store will be a good, uh, uh, give you a good idea what the painting looks like. Um, but one of the holdups for me in doing that before is I was very, uh, very much into taking super high res, super great photos of my paintings. And um, I still, I have almost five months where the paintings I actually need to do that too and that's one of the things that helps holds me up from getting things in the store and my thinking is is that you know if you see something of mine and you think it's really awesome and you want to have it then um, I'm going to try and make that easy for you because uh, uh, the COVID you know it's affected my business out here and uh, you know any uh, anything I could do to uh, move some paintings into the hands of people that want them, uh, I'm doing, I'm doing it. Um, so hopefully, yeah, you can see we missed a bit of that grass. I'm so sorry about that. And the grass was a challenge, and we got a minute. And for uh, so much appreciate those of you that get down to these end bits of the videos, you know. Um, what I really want to avoid here was lots and lots of vertical strokes. You really want... I have I have a good portion of vertical strokes, but you really want the masses or clumps of grass to kind of speak for themselves. It's a real amateur mistake to do giant areas with tons of these vertical strokes, you know. And it can be attractive sometimes, but it could also be distracting, yeah. Uh, because we know grass has vertical nature. Um, we'll paint it like that, but if you really think about it, you don't see a lot of the tiny vertical strokes anyway. So, that's another video. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, turn off this video and just go sit down and do some painting, all right? Um, even drawing, if you can't muster the painting, do something. 
uh, that, that is moving your your art career forward you know as far as actual things getting done and until I come back with another video do me a favor do me a solid take good care of yourself your family all your loved ones stay out of trouble and God bless you and your family